Afternoon. Colleagues, can I remind members that uh, COVID measures are in place and that face masks could be worn while moving around the chamber and across the Holyrood campus. The first item of business is portfolio questions and the first portfolio is justice and veterans. If a member wishes to ask a question, a supplementary question, would they uh, please press the request to speak button to put an R in the chat function if they're joining us online during the relevant question. And I call question number one, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it's improving women's access to justice. Minister Ash Regan. Improving women's access to justice is a key Scottish Government priority across all aspects of the justice system, including ensuring criminal law can be used to deal with perpetrators of violence against women, such as with the new domestic abuse offence, empowering women to access justice through consideration of enhanced targeted support for legal aid, assessing how the recommendations in Lady Dorian's report could transform the experience of sexual offence victims and delivering necessary funding to allow the justice system to respond to the challenges of the pandemic with a specific focus on gender-based offences. Gillian Martin. I thank the Minister for that answer. We know that the impact of court delays due to the pandemic is impacting disproportionately on women and girls and that a significant amount of the solemn backlog is sexual offences and domestic abuse. Resolution to these cases is obviously particularly important and I consequently I hope there's a priority there for funding so that these women can get justice. Um, I'd, I'd like to, the Minister's reassurance on what has been done to clear the black backlog. Minister. Uh, the member raises a very important point, and I also uh, commend her work on, in this area. Around um, 80 to 85 per cent of high court trials relate to sexual offending, so the backlogs in the criminal courts can have a disproportionate effect on access to justice for women. The Scottish Government has invested £50 million of funding to help the Crown Office and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service address the impact of coronavirus on the courts. New court capacity was introduced in September this year, with four additional high courts and two additional solemn sheriff courts sitting. And this is a significant increase from the pre-pandemic trial court position and a direct response to the concerns about access to justice. Efforts have also been made to prioritise those domestic abuse cases as raised by Gillian Martin. And in the first quarter of 2021-2022, domestic abuse cases accounted for nearly half of all sheriff summary trials in uh, which evidence was led. Um, I think this helps to show how efforts have been made to prioritise domestic abuse cases. A supplementary, Eleanor Whitton. I have recently dealt with a harrowing case of a woman in my constituency who told me of her distress and dismay that she continued to be abused by phone by her abuser while she was on remand in prison. Recognising that further crimes committed against women victims whilst their abuser, abusers are in prison, which are coercive and abusive in nature, have a traumatic and significant impact on victims. Does the Minister agree with me that more needs to be done to protect women victims from their abusers, specifically when that abuser is already held on remand? Minister. I do. Uh, I thank the member for, for raising this with me. I'm really sorry to hear about the um, experience that your constituent has had in this case. Um, the Scottish Government is quite clear that no one should have to experience such abuse uh, and especially where the abuse is being perpetrated by someone who's already being held in custody. So, um, if not done already, uh, the member's constituent may wish to report this incident to the police. And if the member wants to uh, give me further information, I'd be happy um, to raise this with the Scottish Prison Service. If a complaint is made to the Scottish Prison Service or Police Scotland, um, prison rules can be used to put further processes in place in respect of any prisoner involved in misuse of a phone. And the Scottish Prison Service could work with Police Scotland to assist in these investigations. So, as I say, if the member wants to bribe me with further information, I'll look into that for her. Thank you. Question number two has been withdrawn. Question number three, Jamie Green. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its responses to reports that the amount of heroin seized by Police Scotland has increased by more than 400 per cent since 2016-2017. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brent. Uh, first of all, I can confirm that the actual figures show that since 2016-17 the amount of heroin seized by Police Scotland has increased by 311 per cent. We are committed to continuing to bring to justice those who supply drugs to some of our most vulnerable individuals and communities. And I would commend Police Scotland for the work that they are doing to take illegal substances off Scotland streets and to dismantle the groups that are responsible for this. Jamie Green. 
Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the helpful update and add my thanks to the frontline officers who are tackling this. But we know that opiates such as heroin account for 89% of drug deaths in Scotland. Drug deaths from heroin and morphine rose from 345 in 2015 to 605 last year. That's a staggering 75% increase. So I think also these drugs have no, no place on our streets, quite simply. So can I ask the Justice Secretary if the recently revised guidance to divert those caught with heroin on our streets away from prosecution is likely to push that statistic upwards or downwards in the coming year? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's worth just clarifying some of the, the aspects of the decision that was taken, of course, by the independent Lord Advocate, uh, not by the Scottish Government per se, but by the Lord Advocate, who has the authority in this area. First of all, the scheme extends to possession offences only. It does not extend to drug supply offences. And the Lord Advocate has made clear that robust prosecutorial action continues to be taken against the supply of controlled drugs. And it's also worth saying recorded police warnings are not a finding of guilt, but a form of law enforcement, which, if accepted, is recorded on the criminal history system for two years and can be taken into account if the individual comes to the notice of the police. So the Lord Advocate's decision adds to the police's options. It doesn't bind them. Uh, and recorded police warnings, I'm sure, as a member knows, have been in operation for more than five years and provide police officers with an additional law enforcement option when they encounter someone in possession of drugs for personal use. And it should be mentioned as well, the Lord Advocate's decision has been widely welcomed by many working on the front line to support individuals and in communities uh, affected by drugs. And Police Scotland's own head of drug strategy, ACC Gary Ritchie, said it will, and I quote, give officers another tool to support those at risk of becoming vulnerable in our communities. Question number four, Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Veterans Secretary has had with skills agencies regarding maximising employment opportunities for veterans. Cabinet Secretary. Well, maximising employment opportunities for veterans is a key priority for the Government. And we work closely with Skills Development Scotland and the Scottish Funding Council on what is a very important issue. For example, SDS is a member of the Veterans Employability Strategic Group. And both agencies are working closely with partner organisations, including the Career Transition Partnership, to enable more veterans to fully understand the many skills that they already have, and that's something that sometimes veterans have a difficulty with, uh, and we are required to develop new skills or gain qualifications to enable a smooth transition into employment. Paul McLennan. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I recently met with Brigadier Andy Muddiman, who is the Regional Commander of the Royal Marines in Scotland. His role includes looking at how the Joint Services can help engage with and connect to local and regional businesses and communities to ensure that any mutual benefit is being capitalised upon. Can the Cabinet Secretary comment on what actions can be undertaken to support this objective? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, it's worth mentioning I've met uh, Brigadier Muddiman a number of times uh, recently, um, and it's uh, important to say the Armed Forces are represented on the Veterans Employability Strategic Group, which I mentioned, and members are currently leading employer-focused work, considering how we connect the needs of employers and veterans, address inaccurate perceptions of veterans, and work with employers to find ways of increasing work placements. Developing our local employability partnerships continues with employability leads considering the skills of veterans and their families to help address local and regional demands. And this builds on previous initiatives, such as the one that we undertook some years ago with Prince Charles, to get large employers together in one place to make sure they are aware of the assets which veterans can be if taken on into employment. And we will continue with that work. Supplementary, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting greater adoption of the Armed Forces Covenant by employers to ensure we maximise the support Scottish society provides to former military personnel, including growing employment opportunities for veterans across Uddingston and Bellshill constituency and wider Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we recognise the importance of continuing to increase awareness uh, and the understanding and delivery of the Covenant and its principles. And as I have outlined, the Veterans Employability, Employability Strategic Group is leading a range of employer-focused work. And next year, we will launch a public awareness campaign targeting employers and businesses to help increase employment opportunities for veterans. And I am grateful to both members for having raised these issues about veterans. And just to say that much of the work that we have undertaken in this area for veterans in relation to employment was undertaken in advance of the Covenant being established. It has been gone for some time, and we are building on what's a, what I believe is a very sound base to take this work forward. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect victims of human trafficking from re-trafficking in Scotland. Minister. 
The Scottish Government funds Migrant Help, the Trafficking Awareness Raising Alliance and the Scottish Guardianship Service to provide specialised support to adults and unaccompanied children who are potential victims of trafficking. And this support is key to mitigating the risks of re-trafficking and includes safe accommodation, legal and financial advice, supporting a return to education and navigating the welfare and immigration system. Okay. I thank the Minister for that response. Um, can I ask what success there has been in prosecuting human traffickers operating in Scotland? And does the Scottish Government agree with approaches like that of the charity Medial Trust and the Victims' Voices Project that best evidence interviews could improve prosecution rates, resulting in justice for victims of this abhorrent crime? Minister. Uh, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act was passed unanimously in 2015 and gives the police and prosecutors greater powers to detect and bring to justice those responsible for trafficking. Obviously, decisions in relation to prosecution are for the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal Service and are taken in line with the published prosecution code. A number of convictions have been secured under the terms of the 2015 Act. But we also recognise that human trafficking is a complex crime, with control and coercion often exerted by perpetrators over victims in sometimes subtle and often hidden ways. And crimes relating to human trafficking may also be prosecuted under other criminal offences. Supporting victim engagement, I think, is key in this, and it's an element of uh, the law enforcement approach that's being taken. And Police Scotland have recently seconded a victim navigator from the Justice and Care Charity to their National Human Trafficking Unit to enable early contact with potential victims and support them through the criminal justice process where they wish to do so. Thank you. Question number six, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the public inquiry examining the events surrounding the death of Sheikh Ubayo. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the public inquiry into the death of Sheikh Ubayo is independent of Scottish Ministers and it is for the Chair of the inquiry to direct how the inquiry carries out its duties. As a member may be aware, the inquiry held its first preliminary hearing on the 18th of November and Lord Brackadale provided an update on matters such as the gathering and disclosure of evidence preliminary legal issues and outlined when evidential hearings will commence. Mark Ruskell. Can I thank the Justice Secretary for that update? Um, police officers, lawyers, the Crown Office and many others will not have to worry about the financial implications of attending this inquiry. But despite asking many times, Sheikh Abayo's family have received no response as to whether their costs of attending the inquiry will also be covered. The family remain under serious financial strain as they continue their fight for the truth. The former Justice Secretary stated that the Bio family would be front and centre of the inquiry. Can the current Justice Secretary confirm that their concerns will be immediately addressed? Cabinet Secretary. Hey, what I can confirm is I'm happy to correspond with the member because I understand their concerns have already been addressed. Uh, if I'm wrong on that, uh, I'll certainly let the member know and let the Chamber know, but I'm pretty sure on some of the issues which he raises around the expenses caused to the family, they have, I know, have taken decisions on this recently that they have been addressed. But um, I'm more than happy to get a, a, a view of the final position and to correspond with the member. And by all means, he can come back to me if there's further information that he wants. Thank you. Supplementary, Russell Finlay. Another family fighting for justice are the McLeods, whose son Kevin was found dead in Wick Harbour in 1997. The family have expressed concerns about an ongoing review being conducted by Merseyside Police. Once this concludes, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to fully evaluating its contents and meeting the family if they would like to do so? Cabinet Secretary, I'm conscious this is not a supplementary directly related to the Sheikh Bio case. If there's anything you think you can usefully add it, um, in response. You know, it's, of course, as you say, President Officer, a completely different uh, matter, but I would say that any inquiry of the kind that I'm familiar um, with, some of the background to the inquiry, any inquiry of that type, in this case being conducted by Merseyside Police, and it was requested it should be a police force out with Scotland, I think, previously, we would want to take the lessons from that. So I undertake, certainly, to have a look at the output from that inquiry. Thank you. Uh, question number seven, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government what targeted support it is providing to communities to help deal with antisocial behaviour. Minister. We are committed to ensuring that the police and local authorities continue to have the powers and resources needed to reduce antisocial behaviour in our communities, including investing in prevention and early intervention. 
We fund the Scottish Community Safety Network, which has links into all of Scotland's local authorities and community, community planning partnerships to support community safety partnerships and other agencies such as Crime Stoppers and Neighbourhood Watch Scotland to achieve positive outcomes for individuals and communities. Colin Beattie. I thank the Minister for her response. Can she outline how experiences and perceptions of antisocial behaviour in Scotland have changed over the last decade? Minister. And perceptions of antisocial behaviour have reduced over the last 10 years. And the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey reports fewer adults thought people behaving in an antisocial manner in public was common in their area. So a drop from 46% in 2008-9 to 33% in 2019-20. And more adults felt safe walking alone after dark in their local area, up from 66% in 2008-9 to 77% by 2019-20. And whilst I think we would all agree that this is good news, we are not complacent and our support for the Scottish Community Safety Network and partner organisations make it harder for in individuals to engage in antisocial behaviour. And I think by working in this partnership way, we can continue with this positive trend. Thank you. And a couple of supplementaries. First, Jamie Green. Uh, the Scottish Community Safety Network identified mental health issues as being a root cause of antisocial behaviour amongst young people. Can I ask if the Minister agrees and acknowledges that assertion and if she will ask the Health Secretary uh, why one in four young people in Scotland are still waiting over the 18-week target for treatment? Minister. I would agree with the member. I think that sometimes can be uh, part of the reason for this uh, type of thing that we would see. Um, if it's okay with the member, I will um, speak to my colleague in health and we will come back to perhaps with a joint reply on um, how justice and health are working together on this issue. And Willie Rennie. Uh, whilst it's welcome that the experience of people in antisocial behaviour has reduced in recent years, those who are affected by it, um, their life is devastated in many cases, and I've got lots of constituents um, who are in that circumstance. They are frustrated by the process of having to provide evidence that their neighbours are involved in antisocial behaviour. Is there anything that the Minister can look into to try and make that a smoother system so that these people feel less helpless in this circumstance? Minister. I, I do agree with the Member and I understand completely that um, antisocial behaviour, whilst um, I guess in the scheme of things it can seem quite minor, for individuals this can be quite a devastating thing that um, impacts on their lives and on, on a daily basis. I think we want people to feel safe in their communities and we want the process for them um, getting help to address these issues um, from the authorities to be as simple as possible. So I'd like the member to contact my office and if he can perhaps provide some examples of um, the things that he's talking about, then I can look into that for him. Thank you. That concludes uh, questions in this portfolio session. We'll take a moment um, while the front benches change. Okay, and the next uh, portfolio is finance and the economy. Again, if a member wishes to request a supplementary question, could they press the request to speak buttons or put an R in the chat function if they're joining us online during the relevant question? Uh, we finished the previous session a little early, but that's just as well because we've got a lot of demand in this session. Um, I alert uh, the, the government team um, and I call question number one, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Argyll and Butte Rural Growth Deal. Cabinet Secretary Kate Forbes. Well, heads of terms for the Argyll and Butte deal were signed on the 11th of February 2021, and we are now working with Argyll and Butte Council and the UK Government towards agreement of the full deal. The full deal process involves the development and approval of detailed business cases for each project, alongside the governance, the finance, and the implementation arrangements for the deal overall. Good progress is being made, and we hope to reach full deal in quarter four next year. Jenny Minto. 
I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide any further information about how the deal will help to support the transition to a low-carbon economy in Argyll and Butte? It's a very good question. The deal focuses on promoting sustainable and inclusive economic growth in Argyll and Butte and all projects will be required to minimise and mitigate carbon impacts. The deal also includes a specific low carbon economy project on Isla and this will aid the development of a local energy strategy and systems through a holistic approach considering power, heat and transport alongside the needs of the individual and the business consumers to support a pathway to net zero emissions on the island. Thank you. Question number two, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the support that is available to small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Cabinet Secretary. Well, like the member, I agree that COVID has had a, an incredibly difficult impact on so many of Scotland's uh, small businesses. And the member will know that since the start of the pandemic, businesses have benefited from more than £4.4 billion in Scottish Government support, which is more than the consequentials received from the UK Government for those activities, including the extension of 100% non-domestic rates relief for all retail, leisure, aviation and hospitality premises for all of this year, which is the only place in the UK to offer that support and the member will know that without the ability to borrow we're not in a position to provide additional funding for business support but have this week written to the UK government eh, along with eh, the Welsh eh, First Minister to request a, a sort of upfront planning process if Omicron eh, starts to be of concern and result in additional restrictions to businesses. Jackie Dunbar. Cabinet Secretary for her answer. As we learn more about the risk Omicron poses, it is important that the Scottish Government keeps its response under close consideration. Whilst we all hope that further protections will not need to become necessary, businesses in Scotland will understandably have concerns about this possibility. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that should any further protections be necessary, that Treasury funding should be made available to any part of the UK that requires to activate business support schemes? Cabinet Secretary. Well, one of the first things I did on Monday when hearing about the Omicron was to meet with a very um, large selection of uh, business organisations and businesses to discuss the concerns they might have about the possibility of further protections becoming necessary. We obviously discussed the need for additional financial support and uh, as I said in my first answer the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales have both written jointly because we know throughout the pandemic that if additional funding is to be made available it does need to come from the UK Government. Thank you. And a number of supplementary starting with Liz Smith. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will have exactly the same briefing that I have in front of me from the Federation of Small Businesses and she will know that one of the things that they're asking for is that there are checks made on the eligibility of some of the grants that are made uh, to small businesses. Is that something that the Scottish Government is considering? Cabinet Secretary. If, if I understand uh, the member correctly, it's to make sure that the business support is as targeted as possible to those businesses that need it the most. And I fully take that on board. Obviously, at the height of the pandemic lockdown, we had to make uh, a conscious trade-off between speed in getting funding out and targeting uh, that funding, which inevitably is more time consuming. Um, I think going forward, it must be more targeted and it must be based on tighter uh, conditions and eligibility. I, of course, hope that it won't be necessary because I sincerely hope that no further restrictions will be necessary. I'm Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary join with me um, to congratulate and raise the importance of this Saturday, which is, of course, the ninth consecutive Small Business Saturday, which does so much good for our shops and small businesses across East Lothian, the south of Scotland, and indeed the whole of Scotland, and welcome the efforts that have been made this year by the small businesses to welcome back in some cases, but to continue to welcome the customers that have walked through their door through these very challenging times. Cabinet Secretary. I, I don't hesitate in joining the member in welcoming and noting the importance of this Saturday. I think during the pandemic, much was made of shopping local, and my sincere hope is that as we emerge, from the pandemic, we continue to remember that message. And certainly my colleague Tom Arthur has done a lot of work with the Scotland Loves Local programme to try and maximise the marketing um, and uh, 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 the, the support for businesses uh, to ensure that consumers, where possible, are choosing to buy locally. And Stephanie Callaghan. 
Thank you, President Officer. Again, about Small Business Saturday. So, asking the Scottish Government how it's supporting Small Business Saturday, um, due to take place this weekend on the 4th of December. And will the Scottish Government endorse this year's key message by saying thank you to every small business for working closely within our communities to help us through this pandemic? Cabinet Secretary. I agree with uh, the member that we do need to say thank you to our small businesses, many of whom are local residents uh, in our communities and who have chosen uh, throughout some of the more challenging times of the pandemic to either keep their doors open or to protect customers by keeping them closed uh, and reopening when it allows. So a sincere thank you to those frontline workers. In terms of how I will be celebrating, my Christmas shopping is nearly always the last hour of the 24th of December, but I uh, will uh, intend to be out on the 4th of December, perhaps uh, to get in ahead of the crowds. Thank you. Leading by example, question number three, Stephen Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to ensure transparency in Scotland's public finances. Minister Tom Arthur. The Scottish Government supports transparency around the public finances in support of the budget process agreed with the Parliament, reflecting our commitment to further improvements within the Open Government Partnership, as well as publishing budget and in-year revision proposals for parliamentary scrutiny. Our tax and social security spending plans are forecast independently by the Scottish Fiscal Commission, who also comment on the overall funding position. Our medium-term financial strategy will outline key risks in future years and how we intend to manage these, alongside a resource spending review framework inviting views on our long-term spending priorities. Stephen Kerr. Uh, a lovely neighbour of mine who is a member of the SNP gave me a copy of an SNP propaganda newspaper. She said I wouldn't read it, Deputy President Officer, but I did. And it contains some, well, pretty outlandish claims, to put it mildly. The Cabinet Secretary herself wrote in that newspaper that Scotland pays its own way and somehow subsidises the rest of the United Kingdom. And given, according to her own figures, our fiscal deficit would be 23% in the last financial year, but we benefit from the broad shoulders of the United Kingdom, does she now regret writing such drivel? What steps will she now take to ensure there is honesty and transparency about our public finances? Minister. Absolute nonsense. Uh, where to begin, presiding officer? Um, well, I, I commend um, Mr Kerr for keeping such good company with SNP supporting neighbours. And I would suggest he, um, I suggest he spends more time listening to them. The revenues raised in Scotland more written cover our funding for devolved public services that we control in this Parliament. And I think it's rather a shame that Mr Kerr would take this opportunity to talk down hard-working Scottish taxpayers who contribute for these public services. But perhaps that attitude, Mr Presiding Officer, is why Mr Kerr's party have not won an election in Scotland since 1955. And on that number 55, I'm sure it won't have escaped a member's attention, but support for independence as of this afternoon is standing at 55%, which is something him and his neighbour can drink to. And a supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And as I recall, the initial question was about transparency. So a week before the Scottish budget is published, can the Minister advise the Chamber how financial transparency and indeed scrutiny of Scottish public finances here in the Scottish Parliament compares to Mr Kerr's beloved Westminster? Minister. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm grateful for the question from Mr Gibson. Um, uh, in the interest of time giving, there is a lot that could be said in response to his answer. What I will highlight is that we do have a transparent process in the Scottish Parliament through our budget setting process, through our budget revision process, through provisional outturn and the publication of our consolidated accounts. One of the challenges we do face, however, is that that is not mirrored in the process at Westminster, which means we are often faced with great uncertainty about what consequences we will receive from Westminster, which creates significant challenges for us in our budget setting process. And I am sure Mr Gibson would agree with me, it would be far better if all decisions over public and spending in Scotland were taken in this Parliament, as a majority of people in Scotland clearly want. Question number four, Beatrice Wishart. The Scottish Government what action it has taken to ensure a just transition for the Highlands and Islands. Minister Richard Lockhead. 
We are committed to co-designing a series of just transition plans for regions and sectors across the country, including for the Highlands and Islands, and work on the energy strategy and just transition plan has already begun, which will consider how communities length and breadth of Scotland can benefit from the transition to net zero. Additionally, a number of existing commitments will help deliver a just transition to the Highlands and Islands. This includes £150 million we're investing in forestry, £250 million in peatland restoration and £242.5 million committed towards the regional growth deals, all of which will support new and good green jobs in the Highlands and Islands region. Beatrice Wishart. I thank the Minister for the answer. With news of the £500 million Just Transition Fund for the North East and Murray, what consideration has the Scottish Government given to the Scottish Liberal Democrat proposal for a Highlands and Islands Just Transition Commission? Minister. Um, as I said, the, <coughs> the plan is to have sectoral and regional just transition plans for the whole of Scotland. The first one, of course, is the Energy Just Transition Plan, which will be part of the Energy Refresh uh, for our policy in Scotland, which, of course, will include uh, Shetland. And uh, the new commission that we're setting up, the Just Transition Commission, we have appointed Professor Jim Skia as the chair of the new commission and will appoint the commissioners shortly. And, of course, he was the chair of the previous a commission that gave recommendations. They will also be looking at how we deliver those plans, including on the impact in Shetland and elsewhere. And I would recommend, actually, that um, Beatrice Wishart perhaps speaks to the chair of the Just Transition Commission, Jim Skia, about this issue. But, of course, I have an open mind, and I will continue to discuss this issue with the member um, and others from across the country. Supplementary, Jenny Minto. Thank you. A key part of working towards a just transition will mean encouraging growth opportunities in new sectors, particularly in green growth sectors that will require new skills. Can the Minister provide an update as to the steps which the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that people across Scotland are equipped with the skills needed for the jobs of the future? Minister. Uh, thanks. And Jerry Minto's question goes to the heart of the just transition because we have to make sure that people have the skills and the training available to get good green jobs as we make the transition over the next uh, couple of decades towards the net zero targets. That's why we do have a Climate Emergency Skills Action Plan, which was published last year. We also have the National Transition Training Fund, and we've launched now the Green Jobs Workforce Academy. And, of course, we've also said that we will give a skills guarantee to those from um, carbon-intensive sectors to move towards low-carbon sectors as well. So there's a lot of plans in train, and I'm sure they'll make a really big difference in the coming years to make sure we can make that transition in a fair way and make sure people have alternative employment opportunities. Thank you. Question number five, Jimmy Halker-Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will publish in full details of its engagement with GFG Alliance in relation to operations at the Loch Arbus Melter site. Minister. Information about ministerial engagements is already published on the Scottish Government website as part of a broader publication covering overseas travel, car journeys, domestic travel and gifts received, etc. This series is updated on a monthly basis. The most recent published information covers the period up to April 21. Jimmy Hunker Johnson. Existing workers at the facility, facility have experienced real uncertainty over re recent years. Thousands of new jobs were promised as part of the proposals that supported Scottish Government guarantees to GFG Alliance, but those plans were then amended and so far only a small fraction have been created. Last month, the Financial Times revealed the struggle it had to uncover the full financial exposure of the Scottish Government to GFG, uh, GFG's operations. Legitimate concerns have been raised about the transparency of these deals and even over what the Scottish Government's own expectations now are for jobs at the site. So can I ask the Minister directly, with hundreds of millions of pounds of public exposure remaining in guaranteed payments, when will Ministers next meet with GFG? Have plans for the expansion of the workforce been shared with the Scottish Government? And how many new jobs does the Scottish Government now expect to be delivered at the site? Minister Richard Lockhead. Scottish Ministers continue to, to meet the group to discuss future plans for the site. Indeed, my colleague Agam McKee has had subsequent meetings since the published statistics in April uh, uh, 21. And, of course, whilst GFG's original investment plan for Fort William was impacted by a number of factors, such as the sharp fall in the UK automotive output, it does have new investment plans totalling £94 million. And I would remember, uh, remind the member that it was the Scottish Government's intervention and negotiations with the group that did lead to the jobs being safeguarded in the first place. And I hope that he would take the opportunity to welcome that, because the Scottish Government did have intense negotiations to safeguard, safeguard uh, 
those important jobs. And as for transparency, I think it's uh, been in the public domain for some time. The number of steps in relation to parliamentary committees um, and other publications where all the information which is not commercially sensitive has been, of course, in the public domain, and therefore we have been transparent. Supplementary, Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, mean, I think it's safe to say that the government has been less than forthcoming in its transparency on this. So, at its heart, this deal is a £500 million guarantee given by the Scottish Government, underwritten by Scottish taxpayers, between Sanjeev Gupta and his father's firm. How on earth did that get through Scottish Government due diligence, and was it signed off by the Cabinet? Mr Richard Lockett. Well, of course, there was due diligence uh, carried out, and all meetings were registered properly, details published online. The sales process and selection of the eventual purchaser was led by the vendor, uh, Rio T Tinto Alcan, with the company's full knowledge and backing. The Scottish Government also offered financial support on an even hand basis to all shortlisted bidders. Uh, and you know, Donald Cameron from the Conservative Party welcomed what was happening at the time, and he said he very much was delighted that the future of the smelter in Loch Albert will be secured thanks to the Scottish Government's intervention. The United Union also welcomed it as a shot in the arm for industry in the Highlands. And of course, Parliament was informed of the value of the guarantee and approved it following proper due diligence, which gets to the heart of Daniel Johnson's question. And indeed, the Cross-Party Finance Constitution Committee on the 22nd of November 2016, back then, uh, unanimously approved what was happening. So there has been transparency and the Scottish Government has been up front with Parliament. Parliament. I have taken supplementaries. I think that should not then require people to be shouting from a sedentary position. I will take one more brief supplementary, Willie Rennie. But is this not part of a pattern? Um, we have got hundreds of millions of pounds of potential exposure. The 2,000 jobs that were promised are nowhere to be seen and there is no indication that they are coming any time soon. Add that to the catastrophic position of BIFAB. Isn't it the case that this government has got a shocking track record on industrial intervention? Minister Richard Lockett. Um, I think the Scottish Government's track record has been somewhat endorsed by today's opinion polls. It shows a 33 point, 33 point lead over the second place party in Scotland. So our track record uh, stands uh, uh, by itself and uh, uh, clearly is popular with the people of Scotland because we're doing everything we can to safeguard, safeguard jobs in this country and create new jobs at the same time. And in terms of the guarantee, it's worth just reiterating on the record yet again, the net present value of the remaining purchase power agreement revenue stream over the remaining 20 years is £286 million, whilst the GFG value the assets at Fort William at £438 million in their 2019 accounts. So therefore, we have £286 million versus a valued assets of £438 million, and that shows that what we're doing is secure and in the interest of the public purse. Question number six, Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, I would like to ask the Scottish Government what modelling it has done to assess the potential economic impact of Brexit on Scotland over the next five years. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government modelling estimates the Brexit deal agreed by the UK Government could cut Scotland's GDP by 6.1% uh, by 2030 compared to EU membership. The, EU, the, sorry, the UK Government's deal has removed Scotland from a market worth over £16 billion to Scottish exporters, and our companies are now facing additional costs costs, delays and barriers, and you need only speak to small businesses in Scotland who are exporting to hear those stories up close. Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you for that answer. Scotland's food and drink sector has long been recognised as a huge success story, and indeed it was the fastest growing sector in our economy. Given the impacts of Brexit and COVID, as well as some of the UK policies that are clearly damaging our markets, does the Cabinet Secretary believe we can still achieve Ambition 2030? Well, generating £15 billion in turnover per annum, the food and drink industry is, as Jim Fairley said, a major contributor to Scotland's economy with 17 and a half thousand registered businesses employing around 122,000 people. We do know that COVID-19 and Brexit have had a negative impact on the sector and the, the sector is now modelling a predicted turnover to, which has reduced by £3 billion in 2020. We have committed £10 million of funding over 2020 to 2022 towards the food and drink sector's recovery plan, which is to follow up to Ambition 2030. And the plan contains about 50 actions to help businesses. But there is no question um, as to the, the basis for, of Jim Fairley's question that Brexit and the challenges to exporters have had an impact. Question number seven, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to help improve employment opportunities in the Highlands and Islands, including for young people. 
Minister Richard Lockett. Our Scottish approach to employability, no one left behind, adopts a local place-based approach to facilitate easier alignment with existing local services, particularly housing, health, justice, uh, advisory services and so on. And through No One Left Behind, we are working with partners in local government, the private and third sector, to ensure individuals who face the greatest inequalities and risk of long-term unemployment have access to the help and support uh, they need. Donald Cameron. <coughs> Thank you for the answer. The Job Start payment was designed to help young people with the cost of starting a new job, but recent figures from four of the relevant six local authorities in the Highlands and Islands show that nearly half of applicants were rejected for support. What were the reasons for such a significant number of rejections and what action will the government take to ensure more young people receive this vital support? Minister Richard Lockett. Um, I'm happy to look into the detail of the, the circumstances in these local authorities in the Helens and Islands region and, and, and write to the member about that because um, I have asked my officials for advice on that and um, it's certainly something we'd want to, to pay close attention to. In terms of the bigger picture, it is worth saying that the um, number of claimant counts for young people in Scotland is 4.5%, whereas in the Highlands and Islands just now it's 3.3%. So it's just important to keep in perspective the job situation facing young people in different parts of the country and nationally at the moment. But through the further £70 million we announced for the Young Persons Guarantee in 21-22, which is also part of an extra £125 million, including this year's budget to enhance the National Transition Training Fund, plus a number of other initiatives we're taking, I do hope they do help young people in the Highlands and Islands more and more access employment and, of course, training opportunities and education opportunities as well. Supplementary, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's vital that fair work is at the heart of our work to build a well-being economy. Can the Minister provide an update as to the steps which the Scottish Government has taken to ensure that new jobs are good jobs? Minister Richard Lockett. Uh, I thank Jackie Dunbar for, for raising the issue and I remind the Chamber that the consultation on making Scotland a fair work nation by 2025 uh, closes uh, later this month and people can have their say about these kinds of issues uh, as we go forward. But of course fair work is absolutely central to our wellbeing economy. Uh, we have made just recently opposition to fire and rehire and support for flexible working criteria and fair work first. And in August we launched the National Living Hours Accreditation Scheme to increase the number of workers receiving at least the real living wage and a secure contract. We have now also mandated payment of the real living wage in our contracts to strengthen our approach by summer 2022. And within the limits of devolution, we will introduce a requirement in public sector grant recipients to pay the real living wage and provide appropriate channels for effective workers' voices, such as trade union recognition. So there's a number of measures we've taken just in the last few months to back the whole uh, ambition around transforming Scotland into a fair work nation by 2025. And as the member says, that will help create Scotland as a wellbeing nation. And question number eight, Joe Fitzpatrick, who joins us remotely. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the Tay Cities region deal is having on Dundee. Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Tay Cities region deal has made good progress since it was signed last December. £35 million has already been spent on multiple projects across the region and in Dundee itself. We're investing in the airport and 5G trials, as well as committing £30 million to local universities to enhance their expertise in cyber security and biomedical science. There are long term strategic investments that are producing uh, returns, and I could go into more detail or perhaps write to the member with the full list. Joe Fitzpatrick. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Um, one of the uh, projects that she mentioned is, is the, the Tay Cities Biomedical Cluster Project, which the Scottish Government is funding to the tune of £25 million as part of the Tay Cities deal. It would build on the University of Dundee's world-class expertise in life sciences, life sciences research, including drug, drug discovery and medical technologies innovation. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on potential job creation and the expected economic benefit to the local economy in Dundee of that particular project? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the example that the, the member references is a great example of the Tay Cities region deal enhancing Dundee's existing reputation, in other words, backing its strengths for excellence in the life sciences sector. And the project is forecast to create 
over 280 jobs and provide a £193 million boost to the Scottish economy, with the University of Dundee requiring contractors to demonstrate local supplier spend, which is really important. The University is also committed to recruiting locally where possible, and our £20 million investment in the DEAL's Regional Skills and Employability programme will help to ensure that the local workforce have the qualifications and the experience needed to take full advantage of those job opportunities. And very brief supplementary, Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Pr Presiding Officer. Dundee Heritage Trust hope to refurbish and extend Discovery Point to complement the Tay Cities Deals waterfront development plans. Given that the Trust receives no support from the Scottish Government, will the Cabinet Secretary consider providing some in the upcoming budget? Cabinet Secretary. I would, of course, uh, need to see the, the full details and see uh, the business case, but I'm always happy to engage with any member uh, on the budget and uh, enjoyed engaging this morning with the Conservative spokesperson and the Lib Dem spokesperson uh, on uh, the budget uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That uh, concludes this item of business. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business.